Hi, Greg Bruns here with another useful tip for you. Today we're going to talk about using subcooling and superheat to troubleshoot a heat pump system or air conditioning system. On the screen behind me here, I've got a job checkout sheet that we use in tech service all the time. It gives us a place to be able to lay out all the numbers with a full, full system showing the indoor and the outdoor uh, unit along with all the readings we got so we know what's going on with that system. Uh, so the examples we're talking about today is going to be with a piston metering device. Uh, keep in mind, in order to use uh, to troubleshoot a piston metering device properly, you got to know what that required superheat is. And the only way you're going to get that required superheat is by using a subcooling calculator. Uh, you could use Emerson's Charge app. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you could do it, but you got to have that indoor wet bulb temperature, you got to have that outdoor dry bulb temperature, and then under the load conditions, be able to determine what your required superheat is. Once you know what that required superheat is, then we can move on to using these um, uh, job checkout seats, sheets to determine what's going on with the system. So for this first example here I got laid out, this is a, a normal operating system. Uh, and our load conditions for all the examples I'm going to give you here are not going to change. We're going to keep a 66 degree wet bulb temperature entering the evaporator and we're going to hold an 85 degree outdoor temperature through all the examples we're going to go through here. So with that said, moving on here, this system, we've got a 75 degree entering dry bulb temperature, 55 degree um, supply air temperature, that's 20 degree drop, drop across that evaporator. You couldn't ask for better than that. Suction pressure 131 pounds, 45 degree evaporator temperature. Uh, 350 pound, 315 pound head pressure with 100 degree condensing temperature. So keep in mind, I really don't care about those pressures. What I care about is the temperatures because any heat pump or air conditioning system to troubleshoot it properly, we got to know the temperature of saturation, which is what I mean by that is in the evaporator, you got change of state going on. You're changing from a liquid back to a vapor and absorbing heat into it and boiling the refrigerant and getting a change of state and that we didn't know what temperature that's happening. That's that 45 degrees. Condenser, just the exact opposite. We're going from a hot gas back to a liquid releasing heat and we need to know what temperature that's happening. That's that 100 degrees. So those are two base, basic factors that's going to uh, make superheat and subcooling be so important to us. So uh, as I said, the required superheat you got to determine off a slide calculator, which I've already done previous to this uh, video. With that 66 degree wet bulb and the 85 degree outdoor temperature, we need, we need to have a required superheat of 15 degrees. So as you can see for this system here, I got a 60, 6 degree line, suction line temperature, which I got represented right down here on the um, suction line. 6 degree line temperature minus that 45 degree evaporator temperature is giving me 15 degrees of superheat, which is perfect. And then on the other side of the coin here, we got a uh, subcooling which is um, 100 degree condensing temperature minus the 92 giving me 8 degrees of subcooling. Now when you're troubleshooting the system with a piston we don't look at subcooling as much as we really do superheat because as I said before load conditions are going to change what that superheat is that's why you got to use that slide calculator to determine what that superheat is going to be. Remember the hotter it gets outside the more pressure you're going to have behind that orifice it's going to push more refrigerant into that evaporator. And then the cooler it is outside, the head pressure goes down, less push of the refrigerant going into that evaporator. And then on the other side of the coin is that indoor wet bulb is absolutely critical. The higher that wet bulb temperature is, the high, higher latent load, higher humidity in the home is going to create more load on the evaporator and drive your superheat up as well. Uh, when you get a minute, take, a, take that slide calculator and just change the outdoor temperature, don't change the indoor wet bulb and see what happens to your superheat and do the same thing with your latent load. In increase your wet bulb temperature, don't change your outdoor, and see what happens to your superheat. The load conditions play a big role in what that required superheat is going to be. So there's no set superheat with a piston system. It's always going to be de determined by the load conditions. So, uh, but that subcooling does play a big role because if you got a problem with the system and you keep adding refrigerant and your subcooling is going up, and let's say you double your subcooling and you've only added a pound of refrigerant. Well, the micro channel, that could very well be it. You had one pound of refrigerant, you've doubled your subcooling, 
but we really didn't change things on the low side of the system. If that happens, stop. If you've doubled your subcoin and you're still not changing anything on the low side, you're just, you're just stacking refrigerant up in this condenser. It ain't going where it needs to go, which is in the evaporator anyway. So just stop. You're, putting more refrigerant is not going to help you. So anyway, so with this particular layout here, this system's working properly. Let's move on to a, a problem system. So uh, we're going to talk about low airflow. What happens with low airflow with a piston system? Well, it's probably not going to be a whole lot different than a TXV system. But anyway, as you can see here, our evaporator is running very, very cold. Suction line is very cold all the way back. So one of the dead giveaways here is going to be this high TD across the evaporator, 28 degree TD across that evaporator. That's entirely too high. Um, something else to look at is that superheat. You got 38 degree line temperature minus that 36 degree um, coil temp, two degrees of superheat. So you're on the verge of flooding back. Remember, I said at the beginning here, we have a required superheat of 15. We're running two. That ain't, that's way too low. So we're on the verge of flooding back all the way back to that compressor. And then uh, subcooling may or may not change all that much with, uh, with a low air airflow situation. It kind of depends on what technology we're dealing with too, whether it be microchannel or fin and tube, but still being able to take these readings is going to tell us what's going on with the system. So high TD across the evaporator, low superheat, pretty much a dead giveaway that this is a low airflow situation. So let's move on to the next example I have here. So an undercharge with a piston. Undercharge. Well, right off the bat, look at that TD. We went from 75 degree indoor entering temperature, 65 degree supplier temperature. Now we only got a 10 degree drop across that evaporator coil. Uh, that's pretty, pretty lousy. Uh, let's take a look at that superheat. 61 minus 36, 25 degrees of superheat. Remember, required superheat on this system for under these low conditions should have been 15 degrees. So our superheat's way too high. Um, Subcooling, look at that, two degrees. As you've seen on the previous example, when it was running right, I had eight degrees of subcooling. And even two degrees of subcooling, even with a piston, that's too low. So subcooling's low, superheat's high, and our suction line is warm all the way back to that compressor. So suction pressure is also low. Um, so pretty much a dead giveaway here. This thing don't have enough refrigerant. That subcooling plays a big role in telling you that because you can see that's so low and with high superheat, we're under charge. So let's move on to the next one, restriction with a piston. Now this is going to look very similar to undercharged, but some, a significant difference here. The significant difference is look at that subcooling. We got 17 degrees of subcooling. Now, if you're talking microchannel system, microchannel condenser coil, in this example, I'm using a uh, example of kind of illustrating a partial restriction because if you had a full restriction with, with microchannel that liquid refrigerant would be backing up in that condenser so fast our head pressure would go up so fast so quickly we'd end up trapping a high pressure switch but a partial restriction you're going to end up with a situation like this where you're going to have 17 degrees of subcooling we still got that 25 degrees of superheat which is too high but look at our suction pressure when you walk up to to the system you're looking at that suction pressure going Man, that suction pressure don't look bad. Well, it don't. But that superheat, 25 degrees, that's a big deal. And before 10A, I've seen that more and more now that uh, the pressure seems to stay up when you got a restriction or undercharge, but that superheat is extremely high. So just by looking at the gauge, you're thinking, ah, oh, my pressure's good. But then when you really measure the superheat, you know, hey, I got a problem here. I've seen that with TXVs too. It seems like it lets the gas, gas pressure get into that evaporator, but not enough liquid. So we're not saturating that coil. As you've seen on that first uh, example I gave you, this was blue all the way through. So we had a good saturation of liquid and vapor inside that evaporator. So with that 70 degree suction line temperature and 25 degrees of superheat, as you can see, our suction line coming back and pressure is very, very warm. So what's going to end up happening after this thing runs for a little while, we're going to end up overheating that compressor and tripping it on thermal overload. So as you can see, this system is clearly restricted. I hope you found this tech tip useful. Keep tuning in to EdgeTechHVAC.com for more useful tips.